thank you all uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I feel sort of like an intruder here, actually, uh, because uh, this is a sector that uh, I am uh, not directly involved. Uh, the person who is directly involved is my wife, actually. Uh, of course, she is a hardcore, I can say, farmer, hands-on farmer, and an organic farmer, a farmer uh, who is... Um, uh, very, uh, you know, passionate about uh, her beliefs and things like that. And so much so that uh, at home, we eat what we grow. It's a for, you know, a few things like sugar or uh, rice. Everything that we eat at home, including milk, comes from our farm. That's where my interest started. Uh, then I got... Uh, inducted into Nandi Foundation as a trustee. Uh, when uh, Anji, Mr. Anji Reddy, Dr. Anji Reddy passed away, uh, they wanted a new trustee. And uh, they chose me as one of the trustees along with uh, Anand Mahindra. Anand Mahindra is chairman of uh, Nandi Foundation. And as soon as I joined, uh, I found that they were doing something with uh, the tribals in Araku Valley in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, this was uh, way back in uh, early, you know, 2011, 2012, that time, maybe around 2013 or 2014. And they were uh, working with the tribals, helping them grow coffee. And that coffee was found to be very good quality because they had worked with the farmers from day one. You know, the Nandi Foundation was brought in to uh, train these tribals on um, growing coffee and because they were there from day one they also ended up actually helping them uh, market this look at uh, how to market it etc uh, so when i joined them i told them that uh, why don't we look at uh, exporting this coffee and creating a brand for uh, arapu coffee so we embarked on uh, creating a brand setting up our own store in Paris and, and created that entire Araku model. So the model is tribals own the land because they are the owners of the land. Each tribal family has 10 acres and there are probably 20,000 families or more than that in the, in the valley. And each farm is like a small microclimate in a geotagged location. So every coffee can be traced to a farm and a farmer. It's uh, organic biodynamic coffee. And we set up complete processing. So the what I told them was, let's control end to end, all the way from uh, the inputs to the farm, the, the procedures that are followed, then buying the produce, processing it with the highest quality, with the best experts in the world, coffee or just from the best ex place in the world. So initially it was roasted in Belgium because we didn't have the roasting equipment here and sold where we get the maximum price. So a kg of coffee at 8,000 rupees, right? Uh, so you can imagine, right? Uh, and we also set up the structure. So the farmers will get typically when they harvest three times the price, market price of coffee. And then it actually is bought by what is called Araku Originals, which is a for-profit entity set up. Typically here, about a third is owned by farmers, third by employees, and the third by investors, which is the model that we created such that every, everybody benefits from doing this because they are the people who are taking the risk and trying to find the maximum price. And that also goes back to farmers. So this model kept on evolving. Uh, then uh, we looked at how we can grow other crops in the same place so that there are multiple incomes for each family. So pepper, other cereals and things like that. Uh, you know, we started growing. Every one of them is organic. So every one of them will have to be sold where we get the maximum price. The idea is produce where it's economical to produce with the highest quality, leveraging the best of technologies, best of science, use the best processing technology to process it 
and control the value chain all the way up to the consumer so that you can maximize the uh, value that you can derive from this crop end to end. So there is now an Arku coffee here in uh, Indra, Indra Nagar, which is again an experiment to get the maximum price for the crop, right? So there is no middleman. Everything is, you know, traceable. Everything is owned by the farmers. I believe this model can be replicated. And uh, so it became multi-crop. We also now are getting money for giving carbon credits to multinational corporations around the world. So in the Araku Valley, typically 25 million trees are planted every year, which has to be planted in a period of about two, three weeks. So entire year, there are nurseries that are working to create these saplings. And they will get their entire returns in this two week period and in crores of rupees, right? Uh, because 25 million saplings are being planted and these are bought by local nurseries. So there are nurseries around that area which only grow these saplings. And the entire process is paid for by somebody else. But the benefit of that is this region is water positive and also net carbon positive in spite of agriculture there. So we, uh, there are now studies being conducted, about 25% of carbon is being added on an ongoing basis to the land. It's, it's more positive, carbon positive now, in spite of growing coffee than when it was started. So the model of how the business model the science behind this, our economics is the term that has been created. So Araku won one of the Forbes Prize of the best agriculture stories in the world, 10 best agriculture stories in the world. And they coined the term our economics. The farmers are also a cooperative. They are part of an FPO. And that's the one which owns shares in the Araku originals. So there are other uh, other uh, benefits of FPO, which we must have all talked about: scale, size, ability to get uh, capital, equip, processing equipment, uh, branding, uh, all of those things. And this requires a certain size, scale, etc. And that's where uh, creating an FPO will benefit. We are taking this model uh, further into. Uh, vegetables. So in Delhi, planning to start in Hyderabad and Bangalore also, where uh, we work with uh, about 100 families, Papa families, 100 plus probably, where one of the farm acts as a manufacturer of organic fertilizer. Another farm will act as, you know, create, you know, they create the seeds. Because all, so again, the model is the same. All inputs are given, including the, um, the fertilizer, which is organic fertilizer. Organic fertilizer at scale is a you know, factory model of creating organic fertilizer. And uh, this, so each farmer is told, this is vegetables, right? What to plant, when to plant. Seeds are given, fertilizer is given, when to put this fertilizer and the produce is purchased, and we take care of the sales and marketing at the end, and distribution. Model is same. So we are trying to now do this in uh, vegetables and other produce also. So the, we are extending this model from Araku to Varda in Maharashtra, Maharashtra, which is a drought-prone area where we are growing pomegranate. It will take some time for us to figure this out because coffee took some time. This also will take some time. But again, the idea is to look at uh, pomegranate as a export produce. You know, with medicinal properties, I think we can sell it at a higher price. Um, and look at uh, the science behind pomegranate, growing pomegranate, how to grow it organically. 
such that um, we can sell it where we can get the maximum return. Now, I feel this model can be replicated. And then I met uh, Trilogen with uh, CCD, uh, working uh, with him sort of along the same model. So he was working with farmers, growing peanuts. I said, don't stop there, but uh, look at uh, creating a value addition process. Uh, of course, they are already FPOs, I believe. So look at value addition uh, and creating a brand that you can use to sell your products under and scale that up. The, none of this is new. If you look at Amur, has been done for, I don't know, 50 years maybe. So this is not new. And there are, you know, stories around this. So now stepping back, about 40% of India's citizens, people, are still dependent on agriculture, either as laborers or farmers. Most of them in, uh, uh, in agriculture side of it, very little value addition is done by them. Value addition is typically done by somebody else. And hence, they sell their produce when they harvest. And they have to sell it when they harvest. Otherwise, you know, there is no storage facility. It will go bad. Uh, they don't have the capital to invest in value addition and finishing product, they don't have the brand, they don't have the scale, none of this. Of course, FEO is one part of the solution, but we have to look at how scientifically and with a business model, you can address this problem. As India becomes a developed economy, you know, so today agriculture is about, uh, I think, 17 to 20% of the economy. So 40% of the people working in 20% of the economy growing at about 3-4%. Growth rate is holding us back. Productivity is holding us back. And the income levels are also very low. As India needs, wants to transition to a developed economy, we have to move people from agriculture to other uh, jobs, other professions, increase their income, give them a better uh, job. Okay, I'll, I'll briefly mention something that happened about a month or so back. I happened to visit um, Taran Taran in uh, Punjab, you know, a village on the border. And uh, we met uh, uh, the entire uh, senior leadership of that Punjab. Uh, and they brought their children. Of course, they brought their children saying, you know, here is somebody you should meet, right, from IT industry and all that stuff. And, and there were about 15, 20 children. These are all 10th or 12th pass. So children means not young kids. They're probably between the age of uh, maybe 20 to 25, etc. I was uh, very moved by their uh, mindset, their model, etc. Out of this 15... 18 people, four of them said they are in the process of getting money to migrate to Canada. They have to raise 4 lakh rupees, it seems, which guarantees them a visa certificate, etc. to go to Canada. You know, there are networks which will send them to Canada. Others are saying, you know, we can't uh, think of, you know, we have 10th pass, 12th pass, we can't think of farming. You know, they're thinking of going to Amritsar, which is the closest big city. And here these older folks are there, uh, they are wondering, you know, they're saying farming is not uh, lucrative, we don't make uh, money, we don't, you know. And, and I was telling them, you know, have you looked at FBO, have you looked at coming together? And they, I, you know, they also gave me a clue also. They said uh, the rice from Madhya Pradesh is being sent to Punjab to be branded as rice from Punjab. And it seems they get about 40% more money because it's sent from Punjab, exported from, or sold from Punjab. So with the, you know, with the label that it's from Punjab, they get 40% more price. I said, you know, this gives you a clue, right? Uh, 
of what you should be doing. Again, you know, I told them about FPO, I told them about, so you can create scale, you can all come together, uh, invest in some value addition, ship the, the point of sale from harvest to when you get the maximum price. Rice is exported, so you can think about exporting it. And they said the best rice grown in India is grown there. But, you know, they said the entire uh, profit is taken by middlemen. They have to sell to middlemen only. They can't sell it directly in the market. I said, why not? Have you thought about it? Have you discussed it? Um, but individual farmers can't do that. So you create an FPO to do this, etc. So again, you know, the story is, see, this, this youth, they don't seem to have any future. Don't ha have any future. Same thing is happening in Araku also. So the farmer's income, tribal's income have gone up. They are all now landlords because government has given each family 10 acres of land. So they think now they're landlords. Now they're working, but their children are not going to work and they are also not going to work in the future. Because their income is now sufficient enough to ch send their children. Their wives are buying gold. They have now bank accounts. You know, they have identity. They have now paka houses. Right? The, the value has been completely transformed in a span of, you know, this started in 2004 or 2005. So about 20 years, the value has been completely transformed. It's, you know, the story is how coffee can change the world. There is an article, New York Times article about it. Their children are not going to work in these plantations. They will have to import labor in the future, right? But they have education. Hopefully, they will find good jobs, but they will migrate to cities and they will not stay there. This is the story of 40% of India. So if India has to become a developed economy, and Prime Minister has said, you know, farmers' income has to be doubled. I feel doubling is probably setting a low threshold. We need to look at multiples of that. We cannot stop there. More importantly, we have to find the right set of jobs and uh, uh, skills to uh, move this large youth population. Uh, otherwise, so what is happening in Tarantan? The youth is involved in drug running and they've also uh, got into drug habits. And things. Huge problem in Pacha. And in the border district, they can make, you know, multiples of what the farm can make by running drugs. From Afghanistan through these borders, it comes to India and gets exported in ships. And it's all through these borders. Clearly, that's not the solution that we want. We, of course, somebody has to grow the food that we need to eat. You know, we are number one, number two producers of many of the uh, products, you know, many of the crops and things like that, milk, etc. We need to sustain that and maybe continue to grow that because the population is growing. And and we can export also. You know, when India increased the price of rice. Rest of the world kind of took a shock, right? And then they said, you know, you can't do this, et cetera, et cetera. Because India is the supplies, I think, 40% of the rice for the world. So India has a role to play in agriculture, but agriculture cannot keep us down. Right now, agriculture is keeping us down in terms of productivity, in terms of contribution to GDP, in terms of uh, uh, income levels of uh, citizens. Per capita income, if it has to go up, 40% of the population's income has to go up. Otherwise, the rest of the population cannot hold it up. So as India transitions to a developed economy, this has to be addressed in a very big way. And today, what is happening is subsidy. So all of us are supporting a subsidy regime, which is holding them back, actually, which is holding them back in increasing productivity, it's holding them back in changing the models, holding them back uh, in uh, thinking about agriculture very differently. It has to be thought of an export industry. It has to be the, the 
mantra has to be produce where it's cheaper to produce, sell where it's maximum price, where you know highest revenue can be got, and create a separation between when you harvest to when you sell. You know, this has to be the mantra. And of course, we have to employ less number of people. You do not want to work. So you will have large scale migration, which is already happening. You know, all the plantations in South are all from Northeast or uh, Bihar or something like that, huge migration. I think even in Punjab, it'll be from Bihar or MP or somebody, some place like that. They are not working. And they also will stop coming at some point. When their income levels go up, they'll stop migrating. So we have to look at this in a holistic fashion. And, and that, I believe, requires us to rethink agriculture. Now, I know you have you've addressed different aspects of it, but if you don't holistically think about this, of looking at the business models, leveraging technology, leveraging the trends that are there, eating habits are changing. Now, who can afford to pay more for food? It's a middle class, upper middle class, the rich people. What do they want? They're very selective in what they eat. Their food habits are changing. So there is an opportunity there to sell to that segment, but then you need to think about quality. You need to think about how it's produced. You need to think about uh, you know, geotagging and geolocation and all that. So because the, the habits of people are changing. So you have to think about this very holistically and address this very holistically. And if we do that, the number of people working in agriculture will shift, go down. These people will shift to value addition uh, in, in manufacturing food products. And we will be able to export with significant higher incomes, significant higher income. Today, all that is being captured by somebody else. You know, we, I told you the Araku coffee was being, maybe I didn't tell you, first win. Initially, we started roasting it in Belgium because we wanted the best roasters in the world with the best equipment so that it's the highest quality coffee in the world. By the way, Araku coffee won the gold medal in Paris for the best coffee in the world because we made sure. So, at the picking level, if the, if, if, if the cherry has the same color and consistency, deep red, the picker will get twice the earnings, twice the uh, labor charge. So they are encouraged to pick at the right quality. So starting from there, they train to pick. We have figured out the entire value chain. You know, it's pro then we imported the equipment from Belgium. Now it's roasted in India, right? We train the people. In fact, uh, the Araku Coffee in Indranagar has a training facility to train coffeeologists. Only place where we can give an internationally valid certificate of a coffeeologist is Araku Coffee in Indranagar. So we have looked at the entire value chain. Then there is a competition called Gems of Araku. Once a year, it's held, and the coffee is auctioned, and the people from Korea, Japan are actually buying these lots, and they bid for it. At the, you know, it's it's ten of 15, 20 times what you get in the market. It's like gold. That is what is possible. India has thousand plus varieties of rice. And all we see in the market is um, one variety of rice or two varieties of rice or something like that. We have lost that complete science behind this. Then each rice from a particular region has some nutritional value and things like that. And we have completely lost all that. And all of those things, if we had sustained it or if we revive it, you know, simply doing that will increase the value addition. Looking at the science behind it and a nutritional value behind it, when medicinal value of rice, 
right? Uh, again, you can increase the, the return on invest, the price for the rice. So what I'm saying is you have to look at it holistically. You have to look at end-to-end. -end, you have to look at uh, technology. You have to look at multiple uh, inputs. Water is definitely required. But the way to address water also, what we have tried at Taraku, is by looking at uh, you know this water cycle differently. You know the amount of water being retained there is significantly higher than when we started planting coffee there. Systematically, they have uh, increased the water table and water by planting trees and by looking at all other techniques and you know, increasing the carbon content in the rice systematically, scientifically. Every year they test it, and the data is available. This is a complete transformation story that uh, I thought I will share with you. And this is what I feel we can do it. You know, it, it will be done in islands, but these islands will get connected and will grow. This is why I wanted to talk about the knowledge about FPOs. Because scale will allow you to do many things. Scale will allow you to address water, will allow you to address the issue of uh, investing in. Uh, value addition, put products and things like that, will allow you to look at branding, will allow you to look at investing in training, will allow you to look at inputs. You know, can the FPO be self-sufficient in creating fertilizer? Why buy from outside? All of these things you can look at. And look at FPO exporting, FPO looking at uh, what are the right crops for that particular region and how we can grow this. FPO will also allow you to look at philanthropic funding for investing in capital. So that is probably something that is required to jumpstart this. Again, you know, something I believe can be done. Thank you. Again, we, like we did before, you can take a few questions. We're wrapping up for the day. And thank you very much. I think you've kind of given a flavor of another experience, but with branding, and some of the elements of science, et cetera, that you've kind of brought into the story. And I think uh, Chris is also looking at a very large number that's possible. Uh, if you want to just talk a little bit about the goal that you'd like to see happen. Yeah, you know, 40% of the population is uh, 600 million people, uh, approximately 600 million people, out of which probably number of uh, farming families, probably 60, 80 million. I don't know what is the number of farmers. 120 million. 120 million, 120 million multiplied by five, six, 600 million people have to be impacted by this. That's a lot. And it's a huge task and it'll take many efforts. And uh, that is why I said, let's all work together. Let's learn, learn from each other. Yes, sir. Sir, you see, every farmer has member of software field. Yes. Why can you explain this? Yeah, you know, I strongly believe that individual farmers being part of a cooperative movement um, allows them to get inputs, to be part of a network. They then become the sales and marketing channel, right? I, I, I really would like, you know, the how Amul changed the milk industry in India. You know, FPO changing the farming in the country and every farmer being part of a FPO. All right. And uh, these uh, this farm laborers actually moving to, uh, or some of them moving to other professions in the value chain. Sure. Being higher value, that. higher yeah. value. Solutions. Being trained for that. Because, you know, the, the production of uh, food products is a, is a small scale industry can be done very well as a small scale industry. Which is what we've been actually seeing over the last couple of days as well, some of the solutions. And Professor, you should share some of those with Chris, the other solutions so, we've talked about as small scale. This youth, you know, would you like to be a CEO of a factory? Every one of them CEO, their title is very important, right? Then they will probably not go to Amritsar or want to go to Canada. Sure, sure. Otherwise, they'll all go. Any questions now? Uh, India is the uh, you know, place for multiple crops. So is it uh, better to go for uh, particular one crops based FPOs or uh, multiple uh, crops based FPOs? Just hold actually, because we'll take a few questions. When the farmer is going to a marketing person or a technical person, 
One more question. This is a quite simple one. I mean, did I hear you say that this story about the uh, coffee plantation and the uh, yeah, yeah. 25 minute increase a year, has that been published? Yes. So, if you would tell us where. Um, so, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation did this, uh, sorry, it's not Forbes, the Rockefeller Foundation did the study of uh, uh, agricultural practice around the world and uh, Araku was chosen one of the 10. And they coined the term our economics and there are papers and news reports out of it. And we'll, get it. we'll be getting it. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll share it with uh, Trilogen and Sure. Um, so first question, see, there is no uh, correct answer or, you know, right or wrong answer. It depends on uh, uh, the farmers who are part of the FPO. Ideally, you know, it should be multi-crop because then you get continuous income, right? Uh, uh, and, and you can also adjust to the seasons. You can also adjust to the skill set of the farmers. You, you can also look at uh, some, uh, because some of these crops will feed each other also. Like integrated uh, farming. Integrated. Sorry, integrated. Uh, you know, but it's it's a it's a very simple answer. It depends on the FPO, it depends on the region, it depends on because see Amul is all milk only, right? Now of course they're they're uh, diversifying into other products. So maybe start with one and then move to other things. Araku also coffee started. Now they're growing pepper, they're growing other things also. Millets and things like they're growing. Thanks. Um, so this is where the FPO is where uh, can help you because into the FPO you can bring MBS from IIM Bangalore. That's exactly what the religion is doing, right? Uh, so you can bring uh, MPO, MBA people or marketing people into the FPO, create a brand, create an organization, create a way to sell uh, at scale to uh, global markets, etc and bring technology into agriculture. So technology has to be leveraged today. Um, technology clearly, clearly is the trigger for innovation in every field, you know, in healthcare or in, uh, you know, how retail is being changed using technology, e-commerce, online commerce and things like that. Um, healthcare is going to change, education is changing, everything is changing because of technology manufacturing, you know, like automotive, if you look at it, it's going through a transformation to electric and to new kinds of fuels and things like that. So technology will be a trigger in, has to be a trigger in agriculture, all the way from, you know, how you look at uh, uh, inputs to the farm, um, you know, how much water scientifically you can do, you know, testing the soil, using uh, drone satellite images uh, to look at uh, you know pests or condition of the crops and things like that when to harvest when to put fertilizer then produce value addition with the highest quality with the best equipment and selling in the best markets again electronic digitally connected so every aspect of agriculture will be impacted using technology U.S. is one of the largest growers of many products, right? Food products. Two percent of U.S. population is involved in agriculture, and they feed the world. Only two percent of U.S. population is involved. In India, it's forty percent. So you imagine the transition that has to happen as India transition to a developed economy. So we need to address this. Otherwise, we will not transform ourselves into a developed economy. It will not happen. We can't leave behind 40% of a population. We will have a revolution in the country. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank all you.